Welcome investors to another exciting edition of Patreon member Q&A where my Patreon member members ask questions and I attempt to answer them based on my 27 years of investment experience and my knowledge of uh, Mark Minervini and David Orion and Stan Weinstein O'Neill et al which is Latin I think for um and all the rest. And if you have a question you'd like to ask me, consider joining my Patreon where I show my portfolio and focus list every week. And there's a link for that in the description below. And don't forget to check out Seeking Alpha Premium, my sponsor, my partner, I guess technically, for an incredible database of fundamental analysis articles. Also link in the description. Let's get to the questions. But one more thing, this is not investment advice, okay? This is purely for entertainment and education. Okay, the first question is from Kevin. It is on a penny stocks and a penny stock, GSMG, and a private placement. Let me first do a one minute rant on penny stocks. Penny stocks, um, for the most part, you should avoid them like the plague. These companies either had dubious fundamentals and that's why they had to go public on the over-the-counter bulletin board instead of one of the big boards, or they had good fundamentals, got on the NASDAQ, and then um, started to fail to meet the parameters fundamentally and or, um, well, I guess by share price, he dipped under $5 for too long and got kicked out onto the over-the-counter board. Most of these things are um, on a trip down to zero price value. Now, I understand the, the seduction and the allure. I was that way too. Um, when I had a small account, I could either buy one share of a $900 stock like Amazon pre-split, or I could buy, what, 9,000 shares of a penny stock and then I would think if it just goes up to $2, I'll be rich. But um, they, you often, they often slowly trend to zero. And even if they go up, the volatility is so spectacularly wild that if you do any sort of price management, you're going to get bumped out. So that being said, I do play the penny stocks from time to time. But um, they're generally more like... Well, first of all, they're usually above a dollar. Second of all, I consider it casino money. The money that I was going to take um, and lose going out to dinner or at the casino, that's the amount of money that I will use to play the penny stocks. I'm talking like 1% of your portfolio, something like that. Now, as far as um, secondary placements and private placements, so companies issue additional stock. Um, because they need money, and this can be good or bad. If a, if a company is hemorrhaging money, money and just needs um, more money, an injection of money to continue operations, that's generally really bad. It's just diluting um, the pie. You suddenly cut um, <clears throat> the, 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 the pie of the... <laughs> I don't, where am I going with this? You cut the pie into more pieces, and so your piece of the pie is smaller. If they're raising money for a specific reason, then the market can react favorably. For example, I think a few years ago, if memory serves, Tesla did a small um, secondary issuance of shares in order to fund the building of, I think it was the China Gigafactory. And in that case, the market reacted positively because it was for a very specific reason, which was going to be good for the company. Now, <clears throat> Kevin, your question was, penny stock GSMG did a private placement um, with a price of $2.48, yet this, when they issued these shares, the share price of the company was under a dollar, and what I thought about that. So I don't know a whole lot about this stuff. I think that, and I could be totally wrong with this, but I think they offered the um, private investor or investors a better price. I, I think that's like a guaranteed price 
that they get that they can get for those shares. So they're kind of sweetening the pot and saying, you know, we will sell you these shares for a, a dollar price higher than the stock, the current stock price to get you to invest. So on the one hand, that could show confidence that the management thinks it's going to be worth that much. On the other hand, they might be so desperate that they had to give them a guaranteed better price in order to um, do the private placement. That's probably what it was uh, based on the stock chart, which we'll look at in a minute. Also, um, private placement, I don't think there are as many restrictions as um, you know, public secondary offering. So they're, and I might be wrong in this, I think they're a little more dubious. Let's look at that chart real quick. Here's the chart, GSMG, Glory Star, New Media, Group Holdings Limited. This looks like it is has a, a date with a price of zero. Um, certainly it is in a downtrend. This would be a short, although you can't generally short stocks under a dollar. Um, you certainly could try to day trade these wild intraday moves, but that's not my cup of tea. I, this looks like a stay away. And what do you do if you're trapped in a stock like this? Personally, what I do, and this is Minervini's advice, as soon as you realize you've made a mistake, you get out. Okay, so Matt Martin was asking about the company BRZE. I just pulled up the one-year chart. Braze Incorporated. You are, if this is an early turn, it's coming out of a downtrend, tur downtrend turning into an uptrend. You want the uptrend to be four months or longer. The uptrend is only two months. So uh, these are generally good for a swing trade, but not yet good for a long-term hold. Technically, you've got this big gap up on earnings. Most likely, you've got the um, very common rollback down near the purchase price. And then you've got to push off the low. So here's your cheat entry point right there. Now, it did do a pullback, and that's not a very big pullback. That's only about 8% or so. Here is your support line. So if it turns back up, you could buy it, but I would just do a swing trade. You've got supply over here, and if you look at the five-year chart, it is you've got a lot of trap buyers here in 2022 who are going to be coming onto market and technical buyers, technical analysts like me are going to see that and be wary. So if it didn't have all this overhead supply, I'd be a lot more excited about it. As is personally good for, you know, a 5 or 10% swing trade. But <clears throat> then I would wait and give it more time and let it um, build out its uptrend uh, farther. 98% of the big moves happen after a stock is in a four-month uptrend. The uptrend designated by um, <clears throat> a clearly delineated upward trend of the 200-day simple moving average. Hi, everybody. I did not change shirts. It is actually a new day. I got busy yesterday and couldn't finish the video, so I'm going to jump in right now. And Matt, before we move on, let's just look at the fundamentals of BRZE very quickly. Braze customer-centric interactions between consumers and brands. So computer software. Relative strength is 93. That's definitely good. Let's see, has no earnings to speak of, although it is moving towards profitability and good sales growth. So fundamentals look A-OK. -okay. I really don't like this overhang here. That is going to cause you some volatility as well as this obvious line of resistance at 50. Okay, then Matt's other stock was GWRE, Guideware Software. This looks like an early turn, Bucky and Bronco. Definitely, uh, it's moving up and to the right, but the volatility is so wild. I couldn't stay in something like this, um, <clears throat> not, not using Minervini style. You'd have to be more of a value investor type. Uh, we just saw explosive earnings here on good volume. That's good. And oftentimes you'll see it sag for a week or two or three. So the way to put a, make a play at this one would be to just try to time out the end of this um, decline. 
sometimes it catches support at the bottom of the gap up here at 90. Uh, sometimes it fills the gap at 87. And it's a little bit of an educated guessing time. You just um, want to wait to see some rounding action and then some tennis ball action to the upside. And some knowledge of Japanese candlesticks can help you with timing out um, short-term reversal. But this is an early term we talked about earlier that you want about a four-month uptrend. And we've only, this 200-day moving average started trending up just about two and a half months ago. So you're really early. And looking at the five-year chart, again, you've got a bunch of overhangs. Some of these buyers are still here and are going to bail when they get to their original cost basis. And then technical traders are going to see this and get nervous and cash in profits. So not one that I'm particularly interested in right now, although if... Uh, it fills the gap and bounces strongly off of 87 and it gives us another few weeks of uptrending 200 day then I definitely would be more interested let's look at the fundamentals fundamentals are fine nothing nothing to write home about web-based policy and claims management so this is some sort of software for insurance insurance is boring but insurance stocks can do really well so I like that Relative strength of 93, outperforming 93% of the stocks in the Marcus Smith universe, which is about 10,000 stocks, if I remember right. Let's see, it is profitable, and it looks like it's going to have a big, um, almost doubling of EPS from 24 to 25, but that can change radically. It's pretty inaccurate to forecast out more than a quarter or so. Let's see, sales is pretty tepid. I mean, you've got... 5%, 10%, 14%, not particularly impressive. Okay, Karen asks, how do you manage trading while being on vacation? So I'll tell you Minervini's answer. He was asked this the other day and he said, I don't take vacations. But uh, for mere mortals like ourselves um, to uh, maintain our sanity or at least maintain our relationships, we need to have vacations once in a while so um, one thing obviously you could do is move entirely into cash. That would be the safest thing. But if you're trying to play some long-term positions, then certainly you don't want to do that. Then what I do is I trim positions that seem overextended. I cut, um, I sell positions that are laggards. Either they are moving sideways or moving upwards much more slowly than um, my other stocks, or maybe they're um, slowly, you know, coming in and flirting with uh, the stop. Usually I would let, give it a chance to play out, play out, but if I'm on vacation, then I'm going to um, just cut it loose, move up my stops, and then I, you know, I have an agreement um, with my girlfriend that this is my job and I need to have a, a little bit of um, knowledge of the market every day. So I just carve out a half hour um, right when market opens and um, you know a half hour in the evenings or right before close and I just check in on my positions and act accordingly but what I don't do is for the most part I don't open any new positions unless it's something I've been waiting you know for months for it to set up and it finally does but in general I just try to keep my positions to a minimum but honestly, I'm such an addict. I hate missing I hate missing days not watching the market. I wish the market was open on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. Uh hands, or maybe it's Haynes, I'm not sure. A couple of questions. Momentum is more important than fundamentals. Question mark. Um let me read this real quick. Hold on. Basically he's saying is it's okay to is it okay to buy as long as stock has momentum and is in a stage two uptrend? and the um, base formation is good. So, all right, this is a big difference between O'Neill and Minervini. O'Neill buys or bought stocks out of really strong fundamentals, accelerating sales, earnings, and margins, and increasing institutional sponsorship. Uh, Minervini and I do not buy, um, do not require um, strong fundamentals. The fundamentals, as Minervini says, 
are just icing on the cake. Now you can do the O'Neill way and you'll get into a lot of good stocks, but you're going to miss out. On, but two things. One, you're going to miss out on some of the most explosive stocks that um, they have poor fundamentals, but um, institutions are buying on the story or on future expectations that may have been released in um, conference call transcripts, or maybe they just have inside information, even though they're not supposed to have inside information. Stocks can move spectacularly while um, fundamentals are crummy. Tesla's big move in, what was that, 2020? Fundamentals were not very good. Tilray, didn't it go up like 500% or something in a year? And I think the company was losing money that entire time. So you're going to miss out. Amazon didn't have any EPS for years and years. So you're going to miss out on a lot of those explosive young um, growth companies with erratic fundamentals. Secondly, coming out of a poor economy, most stocks are going to have really poor. Um, the, the two or three previous quarters are going to have really bad numbers. And they're going to start moving um, before the numbers look good and then they're going to go up 50 or 100 percent and then they will um, they will post those numbers that the market was anticipating and then third don't let fundamentals seduce you many stocks break down when their fundamentals are looking absolutely you know bulletproof when did tesla roll over in 2021 when its fundamentals were at its very best so <clears throat> you want to buy a stage two uptrend, preferably a four month or longer stage two uptrend, unless it's something like a power play or a, an IPO base. And definitely check the fundamentals and that'll help you decide, okay, is this a stock I'm just going to try to hold for 10 or 15 or 20% and get out? Or is this a stock with really good fundamentals that might be something that can turn into a long-term hold, you know, a five or 10 year hold, something like, oh, I don't know, Lilly or O'Reilly's or um, Pepsi or some of those that you could have been holding for 20 years and done really well. Okay, um, hands, you're asking some hard questions. Say the market's in, in correction. Usually the leaders will break out before the market does. Is it better trying to get into the leaders on some re-entry in case you missed the initial breakout, or is it fine also to buy laggards on good formations, even um, if they have a declining RS line? So I was just listening to a Q&A today with Mark Ritchie and um, Brandon on MPA. And so in an ideal world, you don't miss those breakouts. You set alerts on your phone, so you get texts when it breaks through that pivot point um, or you set buy stops to have buys trigger um, when it hits that pivot point because 50% of stocks roughly will pull back but the ones that don't pull back those are the best ones so if you're only catching the ones on pullbacks that pull back to the pivot point you are missing the top 50% so point number one is is do what do whatever you can to catch those breakouts now it's different you know if everything's popping and squatting then you're going to want to wait to the end of the day but in a neutral or bull market you're going to want to jump on those breakouts and not wait for pullbacks so you definitely want to be in the leaders um it it's kind of uh do you want to buy laggards so you want to be in the like the first and the second wave usually um you know let's say a bull market lasts a year or a year and a half, you'll have an initial first wave uh, um, in the first couple months, and then you'll have another wave a um, month or two later, and then maybe you'll get another wave. Um, and But each, each subsequent wave, the stocks are going to be a little bit more volatile and a little bit less explosive. And then ultimately, the final wave, you're going to jump into all those stocks, and they're going to fail. So... Um, you definitely want to buy the leaders the second like right now most of the leaders in the oil stocks have already taken off but there's a nice second wave setting up and i'd be comfortable getting into those after that 
um, you're getting that particular industry's move is getting long in the tooth. Then you start looking for, okay, what is the next industry that um, has leaders breaking out? Okay, Tony's asking, can you cover buy stops and sell stops in the proper way to set them to avoid bad execution? Do we set a range of buy stops with good till cancel market order while setting a hard sell? Specific price also market good till cancel. Okay, so if you can't be in front of the, of the screen um, or if you prefer to trade after trading hours, then certainly you can use buy stops. There are some advantages to that. You'll catch you'll catch it right as it's coming through the pivot, and you won't get trigger happy and buy or sell something intraday in a panic. Part of this has to do with the spread of the stock, the spread between the bid and the ask. The big caps generally have a really tight spread of just a penny or two, um, but some of the smaller caps do too. It really just depends on trading volume. Conversely, some stocks that don't trade many shares, shares per day will have a huge gap in between. So if you want to buy um, a spready stock with a buy stop, then you need to set a limit. So a buy stop, um, you know, at 10.1 with a limit of 10.3 or something along those lines. But the better strategy usually is to not do that. To um, if a stock is super spready, you're better off um, going with a different stock or waiting for the gap between the bid and the ask to close. But so yeah, you could do a buy stop with with a limit. As far as sell stops, Minervini gets asked this all the time. When the stock is selling, saying sell, then you sell. I know you can set it so that um, it will sell, but if it gets beneath, beneath a certain level, then you stop selling. And that's kind of a value investor strategy. But um, what I teach and what Minervini teaches is we're, we're playing on momentum. And um, he always says your first loss is your best loss. As soon as that price cracks, then you get out just on a market order with your sell stop. You just set your sell stop with a market order. Then I guess you didn't ask this, but buy limits, you can set a buy limit for a stock to come down to a certain price. Let's say a stock broke out at 10, now it's at 14, you wanna buy it if it pulls back to 10. You could set a limit at 10.25 or something, but um, I like to be really precise and surgical and I don't like to just guess when the falling knife is going to uh, stop. So if at all possible, instead of setting those limit orders to catch those falling knives, I wait for it to get to that point and then buy in the direction of my trade. That is wait for the stock price to start going up again. Yeah, okay, then Tony also says, how do you manage gaps? I guess we want liquid beta plays, but even these can gap quite a bit. Then if we exit automatically, you are stopping at a loss bigger than your tolerance. Is this just a part of the position size risk and whatnot? Yeah, gap downs are the bane of our existence. Um, Minervini, he doesn't set hard stops. He sets um, alerts. When in one of his alerts uh, is triggered, he watches it for just a few seconds to see if it's start, starting to bounce or not. If it doesn't, he sells it right away. Um, otherwise, he sells it at, you know, the that um, low point of the day. But he just sells it, even if that gap is 5 or 10 or 15%. That's how you protect yourself with this is having your pulse on the market and looking at uh, the volatility and progressive exposure. It's pretty rare. Um, I mean, certainly stocks have fundamental news and gap down, but generally you're either getting a bunch of gap downs in the market or a bunch of gap ups in the market. And if a bunch of stocks are gapping down, that's telling you this is, it's probably earning season. It's a dangerous market and we want to be um, selling before these earnings or reducing risk. Um, but yeah, getting getting gap down, it's, it is part of the risk of investing. Investing does have risk. 
And then, of course, uh, as you kind of mentioned in your question, you know, the big old, um, big old mega cap, like, um, well, let's think of something really slow. Walmart is going to have much smaller gaps than some uh, biotech, which might gap up 75% or gap down 75%. So knowing the size of the market cap of a particular stock and its personality is part of it too. And if it's a stock capable of huge gaps, then you can't play it as big as you can, um, you know, an index. So for example, if you're playing oil right now, you could have a much bigger position in the XLE, the oil index, than in some little $3 uh, oil and gas stock that's capable of huge gap ups and gap downs. All right, let's see. Karen has a question about SMCI, super microcomputer. I know this one well. I played it for a little swing trade back in the spring. Um, managed to miss most of this big move. Let's see what her question is. The 18th of April, I bought it for 115. Okay, so she bought it 18th of April right here at about 115. So buying this little pivot, I don't know what your question is yet, but it's just a little sloppy there. You've got, um, you know, you've got a little bit of supply here and a little bit of supply here. I would have waited for it to tighten up and make some sort of handle here. She says she got stopped out on the 21st of April when it dropped below its 50 day. This was just before its big breakout and run. Since then, I've seen this some more times. Stock first drops and then has a big breakout and runs up. Is this a common pattern? Could you please give me some explanation on this? Okay, so three things to say about this. One, a part of this wicked pullback after your little breakout is just indicative of the poor market conditions. Uh, 2022 and 2023 in the smaller names, we've just seen uh, tons of volatility where mutual funds are selling into breakouts so you get these pops you get these pop and drops as Minervini called it and so um, that was a little bit to be expected especially with um, these guys coming selling their shares to market uh, with this little move up secondly institutions prefer not to buy breakouts they prefer um, to get get in near the bottom of, of bases and at, at cheat areas and moves off the 50 day. And so when a stock gets down um, to the 50 day, a lot of times that's when mutual funds will scoop up the shares. And it's not always, you know, sometimes you get these picture perfect bounces off the 50 days, but sometimes it's sloppier like with SMCI and they're just buying around the 50 day. And so we got this undercut and then a sudden reversal um, up to the 50 day. So I, yeah, I see that uh, much of the, see that often. Now in a bull market, you rarely get these pop and drops, even in kind of a sloppier entry point like this. A lot of times these things will just run. I will tell you when you get stopped out of something, if it's got great fundamentals like this one, watch it like a hawk. If, if a stock undercuts its 50 day, and then very quickly regains it on strong volume. That's a sign. Most of the shoe clerks, including yourself, unfortunately, got shaken out. And that's often a sign that the stock is going to run. And sure enough, that's what it did. So let's see. Someone just uh, rang the doorbell and I had to go answer it. Lost my train of thought. But yeah, that happens from time to time, um, particularly in volatile markets. But like I said, don't lose track of these stocks. So let me show you Elf here. Uh, this was um, a tale of woe for me. I was watching it way back at the end of 2022. Was watching uh, this little base develop here. I wanted to see it come in gradually and just touch, just tickle the 50 day. And as you can see, it had these three, this wild, waterfall, waterfall crash of huge volume days. And I said, forget it. And I didn't check it again. Gosh, I don't know, for um, a few weeks. And by that time, it was um, not long gone, but it was definitely extended from that point. Where in reality, uh, like I said, if, if you see a, 
an undercut of the 50 day and then you see tennis ball action right back above the 50 day that's a sign of strength that's mutual fund accumulation that's a stock you probably are going to want to um, swallow your pride if you take a big loss you're going to want to do the 30 day wash sale rule and wait but if it's just a little um, little small financial loss swallow your pride and get back on the horse okay nico says hi joe i think i'm over trading and trying hard to catch obvious breakouts i think i should buy more low cheats or pullbacks for the market environment so one thing minervini taught me is that with large caps you definitely want to be trying to cheat and you know buy the low cheat or the cheat um small and smaller mid caps you want the pat to see the pattern to develop and buy off of the traditional handle the big caps get crowded and so when it finally gets up to the lip line of the cup so to speak it's prone to failure or at least um, to whip you around and pull back before it really takes off whereas um, the small and mid caps my speculation would be that um, the institutions maybe don't see them until they set up those nice, um, really sharp, perfect cup with handles and double bottles, double bottoms and such. And then you gotta, you gotta look. You know, the the um, rising tide lifts all boats, and the falling tide, falling tide pulls everything in. So if you notice that um, in 2022, when stocks are breaking out, you should go short. And short for 10% or, or so. Um, and then later in 2022 and early 2023, the game plan, most stocks were pulling off, pulling back after breakout. So the plan was to buy the breakout. And, and now we're kind of seeing about 50-50 as is um, the case in a more normal environment. So part of it is figuring out what personality Mr. Market is showing us but yeah so in general big caps try to buy the low cheats um just one example like lily which i really nailed the low cheat on this one i'm i don't always get uh this this uh, i'm not always this good but so here's your cup here's your low cheat i bought it right there and then here's your traditional handle but see it's too short if you're waiting for a traditional handle you don't even really get one so you would have to really um stick your neck out and buy off of this really short handle here or this really short handle and if you bought off of this one would have pulled back hard you would have been right in front of earnings you probably would have gotten shaken out right there now you asked about a few stocks okay so you bought iron and i think i had this on focus list um you bought iron at 824 Okay, so you bought it right here, and then you got stopped out. I just want to measure how much it pulled back here. Yeah, I guess it did pull back about 10%. Yeah, that would have gotten you. So I just feel like your buy point is not really very, very crisp and clean. Um, now it's it's always so easy in hindsight, but see how it's getting um, the institutions are buying right as it gets near the 50 days. So a better purchase point would have been right here, or right here, or right here, and that, or even right there, and that would have kept you in when you bought it here. So by net A24, it's extended. It's up four days in a row. You're coming right into this supply, big supply. A lot of stocks changed hands um, that day. So, so it's very normal for it to come in here and pull back, which it did. Now, uh, I wouldn't give up on this stock. I would wait and watch for it to tighten up and just give us um, a little bit of a more of a handle right here. Because essentially now you've got kind of a cup with handle and also... An ascending triangle I can draw that in let's see here 
do something like that, something like that. So it's behaving really normally. And in theory, when the market um, warms up again, it probably will blow right through here. And then also a, a better entry point would have been, so here's the start of your uptrend, one, two, three, four. So you get this um, blast off into space here, and then you get, get a pretty nice, uh, with a little bit of VCP, large, medium, small. So here's your buy point, half position there, uh, continuation buy right there. Let's do your other one too. You you listed a few here. Let's just do one more. Okay, your other one was BMI Badger Meter Meter. Definitely a good looking uptrend. You bought it on 814 right there. So I see what you did. Um you use this as your pivot point and then you you bought it when uh, it broke out of the pivot point. Um you did have a little bit of shake out here which I like, but it's really extended. I mean, you've got this little base right here, and then you've got compression on the right side. See how there's no um, oscillations over here? When it when something runs right up, then it's prone to pull back. And sure enough, that's what it did right to its 50. And then another thing is this one is kind of channelized. Let's draw our channel here. So you have a pretty decent um, trend channel going. That one's a little wonky. Something like that. And if you can visualize, you don't always have to draw in the channels, but if you can visualize them, then you'll see that you are buying at the top of the trend channel. And in reality, if you were swing trading this thing, that's where you would have been selling this this little base is too short um yeah it's too short but part and then lastly part of it is just this tricky market uh you know right now we just have to be really precise and pretty perfect on our entry decisions and even then we're still having like a 40 percent success rate because things are so volatile okay lee ann says minervini was on the ibd this past thursday and he mentioned scaling in and out of positions you don't seem to do that or do you and your buy points noted are just an average so lee ann i know you follow my channel carefully and i'm really surprised that you didn't notice that i am constantly scaling in i don't know about constantly but i scale in and out of positions um all the time and that's really what i recommend you guys do i'll show you a couple examples is um, do what the mutual fund managers have to do, and that is um, put on pieces at a time, and in general, take off pieces at a time instead of, um, and trade around a core position. Let me just show you a couple examples. Okay, so here's Lily, which I already showed you. So I initiated my position, and then I started to scale back. I took off a third right here for plus 18, took off another third, right here for plus 28 and then it's set up again so i added a third back and then um it continued upwards gave me a really tight this is a very short pivot but it's a tight pivot so so then i scaled up again i did a tiny add with a stop right there there's a good example of trading around a core position and here's another example nvidia so by point right here then I scaled back half for plus eight. And then I scaled back another quarter for plus 32. And then it tightened up again, gave us a little bounce. I added back that quarter and then it ran up, broke hard beneath the 50 day. So I sold the entire position plus 40. That's an example of, um, you know, trading around a core position. I'm actually short on NVIDIA, just a little tiny quarter position right now. I don't want it to break down, but it is looking pretty wide and loose. Look at the price action on this breakout, nice and tight and calm versus this breakout. See how wide and loose that is? This is kind of acting like a stock that wants to get into stage three topping. I hope, I really hope I'm wrong. Oh, here's here's one example, BRBR. So, Here's my initial buy point, half position coming out of this pivot area, kind of a cheat, 
because I still had some supply. And then it broke out, pulled back. I scaled up to full position. And then as it, the trade began to work, I took half off. And now it's setting up. And then if it'll pause out and give me a nice tight base again and then break out, I would probably put this half back on. Okay, my internet friend Miko from Finland is asking about a ACMR, really great numbers, he says, I think. What do you think about it in general? Okay, let's look at the numbers. Okay, I just started with the monthly chart. This is a recent IPO, great price action. The first three years got absolutely blown up in 2022, like so many growth stocks. Um, semiconductor equipment manufactures and sells. Okay, let's see, fundamentals. This is a profitable company. Annual EPS, you got a nice trend. 37, 60, 0 0.37, 0 0.65, 0 0.84, 1 1.3, 1 1.39. Nice little trend there. Uh, sales figures, strong percentage increase. So yeah, fundamentally, those do look like good numbers. I don't, the other thing I look at, <clears throat> wow, losing my voice there. I don't know what's going on. Is you we like to see increasing margins this is gross margin 49 54 47 so it came came back in a little bit which is not what we want to see relative strength is 96 that's really good although it has just been it's been coming in while the market's been going sideways ideally you want to see it sideways or up while the market is sideways let's get a little bit granular now and look at the technicals so going back to the weekly, this is Market Smith, by the way. Um, it recently topped out at 20. All-time high is about 40. So it's about 50% up. You want to you want um, to start thinking about these things when it's at least 50% up the right side, preferably more. So the that just meets our cutoff. And I'm going to switch over to stockcharts.com. I like the... Um, the charts so much better I th they just think they're easier to read they're more attractive yeah this is an interesting one probably one I would not be in your it's it's an early turn it's another early turn the 200 day is just starting to turn up you've still got some supply to deal with on the left side some of these are trap buyers that are going to cash out and then technical analysts like myself will see this and get nervous and swing trade instead of trying to hold for a longer move here is your earnings right here so it moves sideways after earnings then got nice support with a little doji there and then a nice bounce off the 50 day if you were expeditious you could have put on a half position right here but with all this supply i probably wouldn't have done it it's run up pretty hard um, but this was when the market was running up, if I'm not mistaken. Now it's coming in with the market. Um, I would, if you're not, if if you're in it, uh, you know, this seems like a hold. If you're not in it, uh, I would just wait and let it get a little bit further along into stage two, assuming it's going to move into stage two. And another thing you can do with, Another thing I like to do when I'm looking at fundamentals is go to Seeking Alpha, which by, um, not not by chance, but Seeking Alpha is my partner. Um, I If you click on the link in the description and end up subscribing, I do get a little, uh, I don't know, monetary reward. But what I'm trying to say is um, Seeking Alpha is a database of fundamental information and what I like best is all of the analysis articles. So just glancing at them, hold, 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 hold. What did I say? Hold, hold. And I think I said it was a hold also. And then you can just click on some of these and read them. ACM Research, great growth story, but geopolitically risky. You can read the bullet points, read the articles, get a, a better feel for um, the company and you can go back and read conference call transcripts and so forth check it out there's a link in the description okay MUSA Murphy USA 
just zoom out a little bit. This has got a really nice 10 year chart. I've been in and out of this one a few times. You got a nice um, uptrend, obviously, a little bit of acceleration. Often, when you get an acceleration like that, that marks um, the end of the trend, or at least it is going to need to pause out for a while, which it did. And here you got a pretty nice cup and you've got some handle action. Let's zoom back in now. Yeah, so I do like this. It's very wicky. See all these wicks? It, it just is really um, has these pretty big swings interday, which makes this thing a little more, bit more tricky. And one way to be able to stay in something like this is to try to get in on some sort of cheat. But granted, this really did not give us much of a cheat. Here you've got a double bottom in the cup, little bit of a handle, but if you bought it breaking out above the 200 day here, you might have gotten shaken out right there. Let's get the old measuring tool out. Um, oh no, you would have stayed in. So yeah, that would have been a great spot. So you got, you got your cup here. Let me get rid of that. I mean, I just don't really see any really good setups here. You've got kind of a cup handle that came in too hard. Got some wild price action here. Huge doji, and then it reclaimed the 50-day. Certainly, you can always, um, when it reclaims the 50-day after some wild action on that, you can buy, and then you just set a stop right there. You have a kind of a pivot area here. Let's measure it. 5%. You got a little bit of supply here. It's just messy. Um, I mean, you do have, you do have a handle right here. You got some VCP action, which we can draw that in. You do have some VCP action. I would have loved to seen one, you know, a couple more first. And now you've got this explosive move. I wonder if that's on earnings. Let's just check. No, nope, that's not on earnings. That's just a big move. Probably because of the weak market, the odds are this thing's going to come back in. I definitely wouldn't chase. If you bought the breakout here, I would say it's fine. I, you know, it's got the pros and cons I just mentioned. I would not chase it here at this point if you're not already in. Now, if it calmed down and went inside for a while and made like a cap and then continued upward, that might be a spot to uh, add to your position if you're in. Okay, then lastly, then I gotta run. I gotta make, make dinner here. I'm gonna be in trouble. Uh, Caleb asked, when is it okay to sit in a losing trade while it works itself off out? Find myself entering with a predetermined stop and if it goes positive a bit at first, a move stops up because I can't stand it going back to red, but sometimes it needs that room to wiggle before really taking off. So it sounds like you're over trading. Um, make your plan, you buy out of a tight pivot point, set your stop, uh, depending on that pivot point, usually around 5%, or you could do a staggered stop, you know, 4%, and 8%, something like that. And then, unless it does something really wild, like shoots way up and then way down intraday, then just let the stock, um, let your stop, stop or stops do their job, and um, get Get Zen and let what will be be. And don't start moving your trade up the second um, the stock starts going up. You you don't want to, in general, you don't want to raise your stop until after the first natural reaction. So here's BRBR again. Let me go back to, let's see. One second. Yeah. Okay, so here's my initial buy point. And then it takes off, pulls back. When it makes a new high, when it recovers from that first natural reaction, that's where we, you would move your stop. So if I had my stop right here, once it recovers from that natural reaction, that's when I move my stop up to right there. But I don't start moving my stop up when it starts moving a percent or two. That's premature and you're choking off. I bet you're choking off too many trades. So adding to winning positions, what Mark Minervini and Mark Ritchie say is simply the following. If it's at, if it sets up in a good pivot point, a good pattern um, to where 
If you didn't already own the stock, you would buy it there, then that's a position, that's a spot where you can add. If you wouldn't buy it there if you didn't already own it, then you are being impatient or greedy and you shouldn't add to it there. Dealing with drawdowns, that's kind of a complicated se session. Um, the big thing is just to get progressive with your exposure. If your stop, if your stops start getting hit, you know, three in a row, three or four in a row, then stop and take a pause, let some pitches go by, and or dial the size of your positions way down. And in that manner, um, you're gonna let the market action move you out of the trade out of um, out of the market. A lot of investors do the opposite. They get a few stops hit, then they get angry and they start revenge trading, and then um, they make their positions bigger and bigger because they got to recover from those losses. But it's it's the opposite. If you start digging a deep hole, then you got to start filling it in a little bit of a, t a little bit at a time. You can't start putting on big positions when you're not getting any traction. Um, and then I guess one more idea about dealing with drawdowns psychologically is you got to think about this as one big game, you know, one long baseball game every year is an inning. Um, <laughs> hopefully, you know, you got 90 innings, not nine innings. So if you're, hit, if you're having some drawdowns, if you had some drawdowns in 2022 or even the first half of 23, um, you can think of it, that, okay, that's just one inning. Learn from those mistakes, um, but don't don't let it um, sink your confidence because you've got, um, this is a really long game, you've got an almost endless amount of time to, well, you'll never master it, but uh, to get good at it and to be profitable, to enjoy it. Okay, it is dinner time. I got to wrap this up. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the comments and qu all of the questions, but I got to quite a few. I'll try to put another one of these out in a week or two um, or three. <laughs> I'm super busy right now. But uh, and Patreon, if you want to join my Patreon, um, link in the description and Patreon members, I will be putting out on my usual video this weekend. Take care.